the purpose of the initiates of old in inventing and using the sacred language of symbols was, amongst other things, to state, to preserve indefinitely, to file in a kind of shorthand, to conceal and at the same time reveal and make available to humanity profound spiritual wisdom, occult knowledge and philosophic ideas. It was thought that if they had not done this, these riches of the human race on earth could be lost or so scattered as to be almost undiscoverable by the seekers amongst mankind. The real riches of the human race upon this planet, Theosophia, could be lost during the so-called dark cycle when spirituality declined, when materialism and materiality preponderate and again, as recently, when the analytical mind is being developed and used with its tendency to deny the validity of spiritual wisdom and intuitively perceive truth. And so, this language of symbols, fortunately for humanity, preserves indefinitely, forever, the knowledge gained by the great seers and speakers and keepers of the sacred light throughout the ages. That's the main idea. There are other reasons. Whilst the great white brotherhood thus serves humanity and continues to teach, to inspire the human race, its every effort opens the door to the black magicians on this planet, the dark power, whose very existence depends upon keeping humanity in a state of ignorance bewilderment, superstition and delusion. And this is a perpetual conflict upon this planet and will be so until well into the next race when the Christ consciousness and the intuitive powers of perception of man render unnecessary some of these protections. But as it has been up to now, and I'm afraid still is, dark being, sorcerers seek knowledge, whereby to overawe and dominate the human mind and turn as many as possible into their bewildered and pathetic victims. They want to know about those deeply occult powers and those magnetic potencies which are hidden within occult knowledge and wisdom and in nature and they want to use them for their evil purposes. We may want, educated as we believe ourselves to be, to dismiss all that as superstition, but we may take it for certain that spells are real and they still threaten mankind. The immortal allegories, parables, myths and even some of the fairy stories and nursery rhymes were constructed of old, long ago to preserve indefinitely the wisdom which they conceal and reveal. And this wisdom is everywhere to be seen in the scriptures and on the monuments of ancient people. 
in the introductory to the fifth volume, Adiar edition of the Secret Doctrine, for instance, H. P. Blavatsky writes these words. The whole ancient world, with its scholars and philosophers, its sages and prophets, believed in the wisdom. Where is the country in which it was not practiced? At what age was it in its darker influences banished, even from Europe? In the new world, as in the old country, the science of sciences, was known and practiced from the remotest antiquity. The Mexicans had their initiates, their priest hierophants and magicians, and their crypts of initiation. Of the two statues exhumed in the Pacific States, one represents a Mexican adept in the posture prescribed by the Hindu ascetic and the other an Aztec priestess in a headgear which might be taken from the head of an Indian goddess. While the Guatemalan medal exhibits the tree of knowledge with its hundreds of eyes and ears, symbolical of seeing and hearing, encircled by the serpent of them, whispering into the ears of the sacred bird. Bernard Diaz de Castilla, a follower of Cortes, gives some ideas of the extraordinary refinement, intelligence and civilization, and also of the magical art of the people whom the Spaniards conquered by brute force. Their pyramids are those of Egypt, built according to the same secret canon of proportion as those of the pharaohs and the Aztecs appear to have derived their civilization and religion in more than one way from the same source as the Egyptians and before these the Indians. Among all these three peoples, arcane, natural philosophy or magic was cultivated to the highest degree. It's still cultivated to some extent and these same great initiates and adepts, adepts have encouraged modern humanity to study the ancient wisdom by founding this their agency and vehicle for that wisdom which is the Theosophical Society. Even today, however, knowledge is power and power can be misused by discordant elements in society. And we only have to note how all, practically all modern discoveries are used in warfare. May I advise you therefore, if you want to understand further why it's necessary that the knowledge which is power should be concealed, and if you should doubt the wisdom of that, Read volume five of the Adiar edition of HPB's great and transcendental work, The Secret Doctrine. And then history shows us, does it not, that every great revealer of the wisdom, when once they speak, take their lives in their hands. Their lives are always in danger as the list of the martyrs such as Hypatia, Giordano Bruno on the one hand and H.P. Blavatsky herself on the other reveal. But by concealing their wisdom under allegory and symbol as the alchemists did using those strange chemical symbols and signs and as the astrologers did, by these means, they both concealed and preserved that wisdom and their own incognito. So that their real nature and their association with the great ones 
these were thus conceived. It is interesting to notice that none of the great teachers of the world put anything in writing. However far back you go, Lao Tzu dictated a little of the Tao of Taoism. The Lord Buddha, nothing. And the other great sages, Jesus wrote nothing. Hermes, Orpheus, right on down to the latest appearances of these great personages. Hardly any of them wrote a line. They refrained from writing and they invariably recommended silence and secrecy as concerned certain facts and deeds. You remember how our Lord himself followed the same practice and said to his chosen disciples, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, these things are done in parable. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Amongst the keys, there's a very strange one. It is the key of incongruity, incredibility, impossibility, used as a veil, an additional cover, or blind, to turn away the profane and the unready, and yet not turn away, but appeal to the intuition of those who are seeking the light. These veils are strange, wondrous to read. They make the impossible happen, as has recently been written. The Christian scriptures pile the incredible upon the impossible. Of course they do, designedly. And they even introduce the ugly. And even further sometimes, the, according to our moral notions, the obscene. Behind and underneath all of that, including especially sensual and sexual and marriage references, there is indeed a deep wisdom concealed. Marriage in the sacred language and all intercourse between man and woman refers under a veil to the heavenly marriage to the union of the inner and the outer consciousnesses of man and the tremendous power which is the result. Like the marriage feast of Kana, which just comes into my mind. You remember the story? Our Lord was invited to a marriage feast at Kana. When he got there, there was, there was no wine, only water. And so they appealed to him to provide wine by magic. And so he turned to the jars of water and turned them into wine. Now again, that is not an invitation to alcoholism. It occurred at a marriage feast when the personal center of awareness is unified with the consciousness of the monad ego or the two are married the intuition or the Christ power and consciousness and presence shine forth then the lower emotions represented by water are transmuted intuition symbolized by wine now you see all of that is too complex to abstract in its naked statement for the masses of humanity, as are nearly all the great truths. And there's an additional reason. By beautiful stories, 
immortal tales to hold the attention of humanity. Little knowing that it's being amused by magical symbols and allegories holds them, tells them, plays with them, tells them to the children, and thus, age by age, down the race, the wondrous wisdom is preserved. Even the playing with the ball is a magical act, for the ball is the symbol of eternity and manifested life. The great spherical shape of everything, from universes down to atoms. Auras of gods and men, and the centers of energy within them, they all tend to a spherical shape. When we play with a ball, or we whip a top, and we are representing in humankind divine act. You remember the toys of Bacchus? Bacchus, the young Christos, the creator of the world, was a young man, a young child creator, meaning at the dawn of creation. He played with his toys, which were, if I can remember them, A ball, the five platonic solids, as dice, because they represent the basic formulae and forms cut by lines of force in the inner world, upon which all the shapes of nature are founded, and by which they are gradually developed as the platonic solids at centers of archetypal energy and forms influence perpetually the growth of all natural objects. So he played symbolically, do you see, with the five platonic solids to which might be added the point and the spear to make the seven. He played with a top, the spinning or vortical motion of everything again from the universe, all the planets, the chakras, and the atoms, all spinning. And with the whip, the electrical power which maintains the vortical energy and therefore the life and existence of every manifested thing. And as he played, on what did he stand? One of the ma most magical symbols of all. The mirror in which all the phenomena of the archetypal world, the powers, forces, and divine ideas there are reflected in matter. We, you and I, we move among the reflections. One day we have to get behind and pass, and through the looking glass as Alice did, another wonderful an inspired book of allegory into the realm of the real. And for the Logos, this little story also tells it's part of the old Bacchic mystery. The play of Dionysius indicates that wondrous to us to contemplate is this conceiving, fashioning, producing, sustaining and perfecting of universes to the supreme Logos, it is but as play. The planets are as his balls with which he plays, juggling them in the air, as it were, with consummate skill. And everything spinning, the sun whirling, and the planets on their orbits around their lord. And the very atom, too propelled in vertical motion by this outward electrical energy. Now, if man once found out how he could get hold of that noumenon of electrical energy and in his turn begin to use it for his own purposes, the magnetic impulses which make man in power over man, if evil elements could discover that, 
And the wizards and the witches and the demons of the world have discovered it and wreak and work havoc upon their fellows. Then harm, grave harm, would be done as Hitler did. Therefore, the language of symbol. Now, with that brief introduction in outline of the purpose of the symbolical language, let me take stories from Greece and Egypt India, perhaps, according to our time together, and from our own Bible, illustrating this idea offered to us in this age, largely, by HPB. We turn to Greece, not from to her immortal myth, products of the mysteries of Greece, which were very numerous, particularly those of Orpheus, Samothrace, and Eleusinia, Eleusis. How did they conceal beneath the veil, the many veils, layer upon layer, these magical forces and truths? One of their ways, one of their stories was that of Hercules, the demigod of invincible, omnipotent power. The strong man, the Samson of the Greeks. Hercules, amongst his twelve labors, symbolical, by the by, of the manifestation in man of the twelve powers of the signs of the zodiac, all of which must be fully developed by the initiate on his way to adept. Hercules slays the nine-headed hydra of Lerna, a serpentine creature with nine heads, the middle one of which was immortal. In place of each head struck off by the club of Hercules, two more grew. Eventually burned away the mortal heads, buried the immortal one under a rock, so that the monster could no more ravage the country of Lerna in Greece. And there's an intriguing story. I almost feel I would like to leave the interpretation with you, rather than possibly veil your own intuition as to what they mean. And may I at this point suggest to you as students, here is one of the most fascinating forms of theosophical study there is, at least for me and others. Take the great story, remember the four keys which I'll repeat later, and apply them. Find out what it really means, layer upon layer. Take the story, read it through, remember the keys of interpretation, let it lie in your mind with, a, with the will to know in the end. Keep referring to it. Why one head immortal? Why did two grow every time one was struck off of the mortal head? What's the dragon or the monster? the serpentine creature anyway. Who was Hercules? Hold it uh, in the inner and outer minds and, and wait. Gradually, it all takes shape. Little by little. In my case, very little as yet. But I'm going on because I know that if we keep on, the full revelation will be ours. It's an exaltation because, you see, you, you found out something for yourself. And that's the goal of theosophical study. The great majority of humanity, as H.P.B. says, hates to think for itself. 
So here's a way of stimulating one's own intuition and mental activity. Here's a suggested interpretation of that story. The hydra symbolizes the insatiable passion, ever-renewing desire and sexual lust. Thus the hydra dwelt in a swamp near a well, suggesting muddy water, gross desire. But with the possibility of wisdom, the well, when the desire is transmuted. Desire must be burned away by will and its potential wisdom, the immortal head, realized by the mind-brain. Mind-brain in the head under a rock. The hydra also symbolizes kundalini, as all reptiles do, which, degraded, excites desire, ravages the countryside. But when desire is conquered by will, Hercules, and the head's burnt off, and transmuted, it becomes wisdom, the ninth immortal head. Thereafter, the sublimated essence of desire, namely wisdom, will overcome every animal propensity. Hercules himself, I suggest, personifies the initiate, passing through twelve phases of evolution to develop the twelve zodiacal powers, his twelve labors, each of which has a specific significance, representing a power of the monad ego, indicated by one each of the signs of the zodiac. Perseus and the Medusa's head. Perseus, guided by Hermes and Athena, obtained winged sandals, a magic wallet, and a helmet which rendered the wearer invisible. Hermes gave him a sickle, and Athena gave him a mirror. And he was sent off to find the three Gorgons who had serpents for hair. Serpents again. Claws, wings, and long teeth, but were generally fast asleep. He cut off the head of Medusa, looking at her through the mirror, for the sight of her would have changed him into stone. On his flight home, you remember, he rescued and married Andromeda, who was changed to a rock and about to be devoured by a sea monster. But he turned the sea monster to stone by exposing the Medusa's head. Then came the marriage of Andromeda and Percy. What could it possibly mean? What enshrined? Possibly, Perseus is the initiate. He was half God and half man. It means the divine in him is equal at least to the human. His stage of evolution. But um, one in whom the reptilian passions were slain. Three-headed gorgons. Three gorgons. Three currents of the Kundalini fire. The chief of these, if indulged, looked at, would have petrified his spiritual powers. If the sacred serpent fire in man, once transmuted and used for genius and vision, is turning back the pages of evolution, used again for indulgence, all the initiate powers would be lost, petrified. Remember the story of Lot and Lot's wife? They escaped from Godom, Sodom and Gomorrah, symbol of that very misuse of the creative power. And they were walking away on their mission. And Lot's wife looked back. Instantly she was changed into a pillar of salt. The acquired initiate occult powers after wickedness, the faults of the lower bodies, had been forsaken on looking back all her powers were petrified as symbolized by salt.
Perseus, I repeat, is the initiate, half god and half man, in whom the reptilian passions were slain. It's the story of their slaying. The chief of these, if indulged, looked at, would have petrified his spiritual power. But he looked through the mirror of Minerva and so struck the blow over the back of his head, severing the Medusa's head, meaning he refused to be identified with the reality of the desire, turned his back on it and slew it, symbolically cut off his head. His head. He also had the three currents of the serpent fire, the three Gorgon sisters, fully aroused in himself and under his complete control. They were impotent and they were slain. Then on the flight home with the Gorgon's head under a veil of invisibility, he saw there, down in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Eritrea, the old story tells, the beautiful Princess Andromeda, manifold to a rock. There'd been a terrible sea monster ravaging the kingdom for years. So much so that the nation was threatened with death of its people and its crop. And so an agreement was come to with it that it would stop ravaging if once in every seven years a beautiful maiden chosen by lot from the whole of the families of the country were chained there for him to devour. It was agree agreed. And on this particular seventh year, unhappily, in one way, the lot had fallen in the royal family itself, which had to agree. And so the princess Andromeda was chained to the rock out in the sea. And the great monster was coming up to devour her. Perseus flying overhead saw the drama unfolding, wept down with his winged sandals, uncovered the organ's head, pointed it to the monster which was at once petrified, turned into stone. And the old Greek said, and the stone is still there. Descending to the rock, he cut off the manacles and chain, lifted up her Andromeda into the air, took her home, and eventually they were away. I suggest that Andromeda represents the psyche or mortal soul of man, the ego in the body with its appetite. Andromeda chained to a rock in the sea, the emotion. The soul was at first not entirely free from desire, the sea monster, but Perseus, the ego, had sublimated them and the creative fire so that they were powerless to hurt him. The monster is turned to stone. And so, by sublimation, the cravings of the lower nature lose their active power. Symbolically, they, in their turn, are turned to stone. Perseus and Andromeda were married, meaning that the monad ego drew the psyche and the personal consciousness into union with itself. The real meaning of the intercourse and the marriages in the ancient story. Apollo and Daphne. Apollo the sun god encountered in a forest a beautiful nymph by the name of Daphne, daughter of the river god. Before he could reach her side, she fled, he following, promising her, calling to her that he would do her no harm, but she was frightened. She rushed to the edge of her father's stream, calling for his protection. He answered. Her feet became rooted in the ground. A rough bark enclosed her limbs, and her trembling hands became filled with leaves. Her father had answered her prayer by changing her into the laurel or Daphne tree. Apollo took the laurel as his favorite tree, decreeing that prizes awarded to poets and musicians should consist of a wreath of its foliage. 
We do that right down to today. That's how the immortal wisdom is preserved right through the ages in beauty and also in truth. Well, one possible interpretation would seem to be in terms of natural processes, indicating the effect produced by the sun, the color of the sun god, upon moisture and particularly upon dew. That when the fiery breath touches it, it vanishes, leaving nothing but verdure in the self-same spot. All of these stories have a natural, a solar significance. But a mystical interpretation might be the tree is the symbol of the divine life in all its manifestations in the universe and in man. Man is unconscious of its presence until a certain period or phase of evolution is entered upon in which the monad, Apollo, the sun, sends down its ray of will fire, the sun and its ray, into the spiritual soul of man, the ego, in the causal body, death. The ego then becomes conscious that the divine intelligence, life and plan symbolized by the tree are active within him. That the microcosm and the macrocosm are really one. Symbolically, Daphne turns into a tree. The initiate knows himself to be a reproduction of the universal tree of life. Again, spiritual victory over the lower nature and the development of the powers of genius in human activities are part of the result. The prize, the victory, therefore the laurel tree is used as a symbol of victory. Hidden under the guise of fear and failure by Apollo is a deep story of victory. Thus an evolutionary phase is described in which man knows himself as one with God, a tree in himself, as God is the great tree of life. Crucifying on a cross of wood, hanging on a tree as in the case of Christ, enclosure in a tree trunk as in the case of Osiris have the same meaning. Oneness with the great universal tree of life. Similarly, Apollo, later on in another of the great allegories, changed the dead body of his great friend, Cyparissus, into a cypress tree. And that's why the cypress tree is so called. We call Apollo, changed the dead, his great friend, Cyparissus, had died. Apollo grieved, wanted him alive, so he changed the body into a tree. All the forces and processes of nature and their mystical enactment in the soul of man. And that's why the cypress tree is so called. I have many more, but time presses the great tyrant. Egypt. Amun Ra, the god represented in two ways, allegorically, as a female goose and as a scarab, the creative logos. One of the most universal ways of representing the maternal aspect, the universe producing deity, mother space, which is all one of the most favorite symbols is a female aquatic bird. And though we incline to laugh at the goose nowadays, everywhere as you saw from one of my slides or more, taken in Egypt, they immortalized the goose because they saw in this humble barnyard fowl, farmyard fowl, a symbol of deity and a rep repetition of the deific function. For the deity conceives the universe as a germ or archetype, 
and then projects the germ upon the waters of space, sets going the cycles, and it hatches out into the evolving, manifested solar system. How better to say that than a female aquatic bird, in this case the goose, lays an egg on the waters of space. And as one of the old carvings says, then announced the fact by the customary method of the farmyard fowl. And there you are, the Logos doctrine, the sound of the voice. And so in one papyrus, I found the deity Amen-Ra in his creative aspect referred to as, no irreverence in this, the great cackler, one of his names. And he's carved everywhere, the goose and that egg of the universe, which you find also in Hinduism, Brahmananda, the egg of Brahma. Brahma in his feminine aspect, lay the egg over on the waters of space and by the rhythmic beating of the wings of Hamsa, the great swan, hatched out that egg and the universe appeared. Hamsa, the swan, the creative, all-producing mother of the universe, space itself. The scarab, by this lowly beetle, elevated to be a symbol of the divine, according to its life habits, which are as follows. The female scarab, she's a pretty little beetle, lays its egg on the ground and with its hind leg no, first of all it covers it with mud in the neighborhood near the water mud and dung decaying vegetable matter it makes that into a ball and rolls the ball into a little depression in the sand there leaves it for the sun to hatch out the lava is produced and finds itself inside the source of its own nutriment and eats, grows till it finds itself on the outside by which time the full beetle development has occurred. Thereafter it flies away and in its turn repeats the process. So they call the little beetle Kahepera, meaning K-H-E-P-E-R-A, Kahepera, which we call the scarab, meaning in the old Egyptian language, he who rolls. How perfect a piece of symbology also. For what does the creative Logos do? Sets the cycles in motion again. And in this very way, conceives the archetype the germ of things to be, an egg. That marvelous symbol of the egg. Lays it as it were, and closes it in matter. The archetypal concept laid or imparted to and within virginal space. Heat and moisture, the various occult forces, bring about its development after it's been rolled into a good position. Cyclical, vortical motion. Then evolution and the life forces symbolized by the sun take charge. Living things emerge and find themselves surrounded with the needs for their life, inner and outer, as we all do abundantly within, though we don't discover it till later on. Everywhere around us, without, and we eat our way symbolically to the time when we will spread our wings, listening wings, and as egos, make the great flight 
from the aloe to the aloe. The ancients who used and invented the sacred language observed nature intimately. And the foundation of that language seems to me to be that earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. It's Browning puts it. They saw God mirrored everywhere. And the most perfect symbols are in all nature, expressions as they are, of God himself. And the essence of the wisdom religion, which is divinity and truth, perceived by the human mind and spirit, reverenced in the human heart, and lived out in action, that is theosophy. Then everything is seen to possess a sacred significance. All is known as divine. But that, of course, was far too difficult for the populace, and even for many of us today, to abstract. And so it was symbolized by something that everybody could see going on before them. The abstract was made concrete by the use of symbols. These were put together and the allegorical language was the result. I can't, for want of time, deal with stories in the Bible, though I will do so if you like in the discussion period, or in India, but I just want one, one or two fairy tales, and perhaps a nursery rhyme. The Sleeping Beauty, one of the oldest of the old fairy stories, which are part of the spiritual treasure of man given to humanity in its childhood day. Very briefly, the princess fell asleep for certain reasons which I haven't time to go. In a palace of sleep, a kind of curse was pronounced. And everything was crystallized as it was. With, all, with the princess, her waiting maids, all the courtiers, the servants, everything suddenly still. Fast asleep. In the palace of sleep. Centuries passed. And all slept on until the hero comes on the scene, sees the beautiful young princess, for age has not touched her at all, stoops down in love, imprints the kiss, great symbol in the sacred language. She wakens. The whole household awakens. Forty years awakened, they're all as young as when they went to sleep. Life is resumed, and the marriage, yes, the inevitable marriage occurs. Many interpretations. The major one, of course, Manbantara and Pralaya. But in the mystical sense, the Kundalini, she represents the female force asleep in humanity in the body, the palace of sleep. Evolution, Prince Charming, the hero, and, in, and the adept Hierophant bring down the arsenic, awakening fire, which touches the sleeping serpent fire intimately. And the Lini awakes. Consciousness is freed from the body, unified with the ego. The marriage occurs. Cinderella and the two ugly sisters. Another very ancient story. 
You find a version of that in the old Egyptian mythology. I think she's the fifth root race and the evolving mind and intuition. Why? The name? Stone Blue? Cinderella? Cinders! That's how they give you the clue and hint. Fire! Symbol of the mind. She's the dawning intellect. The youngest sister. The ugly ones seem to be the predecessor. The Atlantean and the monstrous Lemurian. Ugly by modern standards. Despising her because they can't understand mind and emotion. Mind and intuition. They seek to keep her down in drudgery because they know if once she arises into power, their age will be gone. But again, evolution, the prince, I can't touch on all the symbology, discovers her, the ego it is. And then there's all the magic of the fairy godmother, the adept teacher, and the hours and the times into which I can't go leading again to the heavenly marriage and the manifestation in fifth root, root race, man of Manas, and later on, in Jewishness. And last, a little rhyme. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling up. Any intuitive flashes? Well, who did that? Pardon? You needn't go so far back as that. Very well. The Atlantean race. Water. Whenever you get water, you always know it deals with the intuition. Jack, the personality, in this case, Jill the ego, evolving or learning self-consciously to use the emotional faculty, changing instinct into self-conscious feeling. Whenever you get an enclosing pitcher, jug, bucket or anything, it always means the self-conscious use of the power as also does a single object, like a single act. The self-conscious use of the creative activity as against the instinctual use of the animal. In this case, the Atlanteans went up the hill, full of clues, the hill of evolution to a higher conscious state, to get a pail of water, self-conscious emotion. But, Jack, personality fell down as well, we know into black magic and sensuality and elemental worship. And so grievous was the error that the ego itself became involved. Jill came tumbling off. And so, do you see, there is a deep wisdom, wisdom hidden everywhere in nature and in these glorious and immortal stories, nursery tales and rhymes. But it would seem would it not that the time for unveiling has come, pointing to another aspect of our work, the use of the interpretative mind and wisdom. Perhaps that is why H.P.B. called her very first book Isis. Unveiled.